Samuel tonight. Let's pray, and then we're going to look at this. A lot of things interesting about this material. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, grateful for your goodness and your mercy, grateful that we live in times like these when the gospel uh, can shine as brightly as it has shone since perhaps the Middle Ages. Grateful that you are, as the psalmist speaks, you're a mighty fortress to us. You're our strong tower. And that all that must happen for the gospel to take over this culture is for that one little word, that one word of God to rise with healing in his wings. Help us to be faithful to love the Lord Jesus and love his gospel. To love to tell the story of Jesus and his love. And tonight, help us to see, as we look at this uh, fascinating historical narrative in 1 Samuel, help us to see Jesus Christ and be drawn nearer to him as our prophet, priest, and king. We ask this in his name. Amen. Well, we've got one of our chief media experts who fell ill this afternoon. Michelle is not here, so we're uh, scrambling to put things together. Brother Norman, are we going to be able to show those things that we've show the uh, the slides and the video at their proper time. Uh, it's it was should have been in the email as an attachment. Got it? Okay. All right, when we come to 1 Samuel, we are we're transitioning. In fact, that's the key word. It's a transition from the days of the judges to the days of the kings. And uh, I want to read you just a brief intro, and then we will look at a text that will be our uh, sort of a theme text of the book. Samuel is positioned in, in the history of the Jews as the last judge. If you remember the judges, he's the last judge, and he's the first great prophet in Israel. And he anoints the first king. And the king that he anoints, in fact, there are three figures, uh, primary figures in 1 Samuel. There are Samuel, Saul, and David. The king he anoints is on paper and really even by observation, a pretty impressive physical specimen. But his heart is not right. And this results in the kingdom being taken away from him and from his family because historically, if you were you were anointed king, then all things being equal, your son would would be your successor. And that doesn't happen in this case. And Samuel then anoints young David as the king elect. And even before David is king, he proves to be uh, a growing threat to Saul. And Saul undergoes a real fit of of jealousy that, that increases uh, that really takes on the appearance of insanity, really. God protects David, even though Saul attempts to take his life. And he delivers David to ultimately be king. Something really strange happens in this book. Saul consults this witch at Endor. And when, when he seeks her out, and there's, there's, there's mystery here as to what we ought to think about witchcraft. I think we ought, to th- we ought to recognize it is true. It's real. As he seeks her out, she basically predicts his doom and his downfall. And when he does this, if you know the narrative, you know that after she's predicted this, the next day Saul and his sons are killed in combat. 
So that's, that's what we're going to be looking at in this book. I want you to stand with me. I want to read uh, a key passage. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, uh, 22 and 23. This is where Saul is basically trying to defend his, his, twisting, uh, his twisted approach to what he calls obedience to God, which is clearly disobedience to God. And Samuel says in verse 22, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. These are sobering words for Saul to heal here coming back from battle, having been ordered by God to take to execute every uh, person and animal in the aftermath of the battle, and he brings back spoils and tries to justify it, saying, well, I brought these back to, to sacrifice to the Lord. And we learn in this that, that you can't take God's word and then shape it like you want it to be shaped. It's kind of like the Garden of Eden experience. It may seem like a, a small difference, nuanced differently, but it's not small to God when he has given the command he expects it to be carried out. So we're reading here the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to see in this what we need to see about Jesus Christ. And also, again, always, I hope you use the Bible as a mirror to your, to your a lamp and to your feet, a light into your path, but it's also a searchlight uh, into your soul and learn more about ourselves and more about how God would have us to be as we look at this. Thank you. Be seated. If we can, if we can do it at this time, I would like. To, is there? We don't have the video. Can you? Uh, do you have access to YouTube there to, to pull that up? We may be able to go that direction. While he's doing that, uh, let me ask you about in your reading. If you've read First Samuel recently, what what stands out to you in the books? Anybody been reading it recently? Yes, Georgia. Yeah, that's it's interesting, isn't it? You would think, okay, we're leaving the judges where everyone did that which was right in his own eyes, <laughs> moving into the days of the kings when you would think someone anointed by God would be more careful. And yet Saul is still doing what seems right in his own eyes. The difference is the judges were just, were just wholesale uh, abandoning the way of God. Saul is, is shaping the will of God to his preference. By the way, both are deadly. Outright, outright rebellion, subtle, uh, subtle changing, both rebellion. It's, it's fascinating to me that that this that that uh, Samuel says rebellion is as the sin of divination of uh, dabbling in 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 dark spirits. Presumption, presuming upon the Lord. That's that's. Saul's sin, isn't it, when you cut it down, presuming upon the Lord. Presumption is iniquity and idolatry. We talked this morning in Sunday school that covetousness is idolatry, Paul says in the New Testament. Samuel says in the Old Testament that presumption is idolatry. So it's, uh, it's kind of staggering. Let's go ahead and move through this, and, and perhaps the fellows in the back can pull up a the video from the Bible Project. If they can't, by the way, you you owe it to yourself to watch this at home. You need to access your your through your smartphone or tablet or computer. Go to YouTube.com. When you get to YouTube.com, type in uh, Bible Project First Samuel. It'll take you to that video. It is a again very well done capturing of uh, the summary. Uh, I think I, I typically yes. Is it there? Also among his. Own. All right. Great. Thank you, Norman. 
the books of First and Second Samuel. There are two separate books in our modern Bibles, but that division is due simply to scroll length. It was originally written as one coherent story. We're just going to cover the book of 1 Samuel in this video. So after Israel was rescued from slavery in Egypt, they made a covenant with God at Mount Sinai and eventually came into the Promised Land. And there Israel was supposed to be faithful to God and obey the covenant commands. Before the book of Samuel, judges showed how Israel failed at that task big time. It was a period of moral chaos and it showed Israel's need for wise, faithful leaders. The book of Samuel provides an answer to that need. The book of Samuel's story focuses on three main characters. The prophet Samuel, where the book gets its name, and then King Saul, and after that, King David. And all three of them transitioned Israel from a group of tribes ruled by judges into a unified kingdom ruled by King David in Jerusalem. And the book of Samuel has a fascinating design that weaves the story of these three characters together in four main parts. Samuel, he's the key leader and prophet in the first section of the book, but then he also plays a key role in the next section, which is Saul's story. And it's told in two movements, Saul's rise to power and then his failures. And the second part is about his downfall and his tragic death. And then the drama of Saul's demise is matched by David's exciting rise to power. And then David's story is told in two movements. First, he rides the wave of his success, followed by his own tragic failure and the slow self-destruction of his family and then his kingdom. The book concludes with an epilogue that reflects back over the whole story. So let's dive in and see how this all unfolds. Part one picks up from the chaos of the book of Judges, and we're introduced to a touching story about a woman named Hannah. And she's grieved because she has never been able to have children. And by God's grace, she finally has a son named Samuel. And in joy, she sings this amazing poem in chapter 2. And the poem is all about how God opposes the proud and exalts the humble, about how despite tragedies and human evil, God is working out his purposes in history. And also it's about how God will one day raise up an anointed king for his people. Now, Hannah's poem has been placed here at the beginning of the book to introduce these key themes that we're going to see throughout the whole story, like the next one. Samuel grows up and becomes a great prophet and leader for the people of Israel, at the same time that the Philistines rise to power as Israel's arch nemesis. And in this crucial battle, the Israelites get arrogant, and instead of praying and asking God for help, they trot out the Ark of the Covenant as this kind of magic trophy that will automatically grant them victory in battle. And so because of their arrogant presumption, God allows Israel to lose the battle and the ark is stolen. So the Philistines, they take the ark and they place it in the temple of their god, Dagon. And then the God of Israel defeats the Philistines and the god Dagon without an army by sending plagues on the people. And then the Philistines don't want the ark anymore, obviously, and they send it back to Israel. And the point of this little story seems to be this. God is not Israel's trophy, and he opposes pride among the Philistines, but also among his own people. And so Israel needs to remain humble and obedient if they want to experience God's covenant blessing, which opens up into the next large section. The Israelites come to Samuel and they say, hey, we want a king like all the other nations have. Go find one for us. And so Samuel, he's kind of ticked off and he goes to consult with God. And God says, yes, their motives are all wrong, but if a king is what they want, give them one. And so we're introduced to the figure of Saul. Now, Saul is a tragic figure because he begins full of promise. He's tall, he's good looking, he's a perfect candidate for a king, but he has deep character flaws. He's dishonest, he lacks integrity, and he seems incapable of acknowledging his own mistakes. And so these flaws become his downfall. He wins some battles at the beginning, but his flaws run so deep, he eventually disqualifies himself by blatantly disobeying God's commands. And so the aging Samuel confronts Saul and Israel. He had warned the people that they would only benefit from a king who's humble and faithful to God. Otherwise, the kings of Israel will bring ruin. So he informs Saul that God is going to raise up a new king to replace him. And so Saul's downfall begins, as God at the same time is working behind the scenes to raise up that new king. It's an insignificant shepherd boy named David. 
he's the least likely candidate to be king. But the famous story of David and Goliath shows that God's choice of David is not based on his family status, but simply on his radical and humble trust in the God of Israel. And so this story embodies all of the themes of Hannah's poem. Proud Saul and Goliath are brought low, while humble David is exalted. From here, we watch Saul slowly descend into madness, while David rises to power. So David starts working for Saul as a general, and he's winning all of the battles, and he's also winning all of the fame. And so Saul gets jealous, and he starts chasing David around, hunting him, trying to kill him. David's done nothing wrong, and so David simply runs and waits in the wilderness. And here we see David's true character. He has multiple opportunities to kill Saul, but he doesn't. He simply trusts that despite Saul's evil, God will raise up a king for his people. What's interesting, too, is that many of the poems of David that you find in the book of Psalms are linked to this very period of his life, and they all express the same attitude of trust. And so this section of the book ends with Saul coming to a grisly death after losing a battle with the Philistines. First Samuel tells some of the most intricate, well-told stories you find anywhere in the Bible. And the characters Saul and David, they're portrayed very realistically. And the author's putting them forward as character studies so that you can find yourself in them. So in Saul's story, we see a warning. It's crucial that we reflect on our own character flaws and how they harm us and other people. And with God's help, we need to humble ourselves and deal with our dark side so that Saul's story doesn't become ours. David, on the other hand, is presented as an example of patience and trust in God's timing in our lives. And so he's running in the wilderness, being chased by Saul. David had every reason to think that God had abandoned him, but that's not what he thinks. And so David's story encourages us to trust that despite human evil, God is working out his purposes to oppose the proud and to exalt the humble. And that's what 1 Samuel is all about. Okay, thank you. Again, another excellent visual summary of this book. Originally, it was all considered one document, Samuel, and it was divided up. So let's, let's look at the, some uh, outline aspects, sort of the flow of it. It takes place over about a 94-year period, and it all happens in, in the Promised Land, in the land of Canaan. If you were going to break it down, and you saw, you saw one uh, breakdown there, 1 Samuel 1, 1 to 7, 17 is the decline of the judges and, and Samuel making that transition move from the last judge uh, to the first uh, prophet. There's a transition of leadership from Eli to Samuel in, in first, uh, chapter 1, 1 through 321. Uh, then... Uh, Samuel, as finishing up as being a judge, moving into the role of prophet, 4, 1 to 7, 17. And then chapter 8 and moving forward to the end of the book is the rise of the kings. Uh, and so you have Saul, and you see this transition of leadership. When, when Samuel has anointed Saul, then, then Saul takes the role of, of leader. And you have his reign, which is short-lived because of his disobedience, chapter 13, 1 to 15, 9. And then this transition of leadership where Saul... Uh, Saul's demise, as has been described to you, and David's rise. Um, I want to read a few things to you that happened in the, in the flow of this. Remember Eli's, uh, Eli faces the judgment of God as a priest in Israel. His sons uh, offered false fire and, and, and are punished. Um, the birth of Samuel, though, Elkanah and, and Hannah had no children. God gives her. And there's a beautiful, uh, in the opening uh, verses of 1 Samuel, this beautiful song that she, that she sings. She says, first of all, 1 Samuel 1, 27, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. Remember her promise, God, if you'll give me a son, I will dedicate him to your service. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and, and, she, and he worshiped the Lord there. And so you have this, this song 
that is that they burst out of beautiful. You need to read that in, in chapter uh, two. Then uh, this corruption, as I mentioned, uh, at Shiloh, where Eli's sons uh, lead to Israel's defeat. Then the Ark of the Covenant. Why would you think? Let me ask you this. Why would you think they would they would take the Ark of the Covenant and go into battle against the Philistines? Do you remember? God has basically commanded them, hasn't he, nearly every time they go to war to take the Ark of the Covenant with them. What was wrong here was that they presumed upon God. If they had sought the Lord and the Lord had commanded that, then uh, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant became sort of a rabbit's foot to them. If we just have the Ark out in front of us, then we'll be okay. And God punishes them with that, of course, by the, by the confiscation of it uh, because the Ark of the Covenant symbolizes God's throne among the people. The Philistines take it, of course. They take it back to their capital. They set it at the feet of, the, of their god, Dagon, and uh, they go and check on it, and, and Dagon has fallen over, and they, they take him and patch him back up and stand him back up and go back and check again, and he's fallen over again at the foot of the ark. And, of course, then the plague comes, and, and they really want nothing to do. They put the ark on a, on a cart and send it. Just, just get it out of here. We don't want it. It's, it's bad luck for them as they would think about things. Now, the people become impatient. Uh, they want a leader. They're not able to uh, bring themselves to trust the invisible God and, and who he is, the different ones he's brought in to lead. And they want a clearly identified leader. They want a king, uh, as they say, like the rest of the nations have a king. And we're going to see in a minute when we look through portions of Samuel that, that God had intended and had stated even before this time that he would give them a king. Uh, but his desire was to give them a king uh, after his heart. And the people wanted something else, and so God gave them exactly what they asked for. There's a, you hear people say sometimes, be careful what you ask for. Uh, they got exactly what they asked for. They didn't ask for the right thing. That was the problem. Um, then you have the trans transition of, from Saul to David. We'll be looking at that a little more in, in detail. So you, 1 Samuel brings to the end the life of Saul and the beginning of David's ascendancy. Second Samuel will be about that. It's a historical narrative. So when you're reading it, I would encourage you just to read through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Read it as one continuous narrative because that's what it is. The, the, the break is somewhat artificial. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, David escapes from Saul, even though Saul looks, hunts him down. And there are two times you may remember where David had an opportunity. He sta actually stands over Saul and could have taken his life, and yet he, he, he backs away and realizes he needs to, as, as the Scripture teaches us later, you know, uh, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Don't take that into your own hand. Leave space for the vengeance of God, and so, so David backs away. Uh, as far as the introduction to it in the title, I've already told you it's a transition from judges to kings with these three dominant figures, Samuel, Saul, and David. These books were originally one book in the Hebrew Bible. They were known as the book of Samuel, or for shorthand, just known as Samuel. Uh, it's interesting, when, you, when it's translated different ways, it sometimes is translated as the name of God, his name is God, heard of God, asked of God. Uh, then it's the Septuagint, it's the, it's the, uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament that actually divides Samuel into 1st and 2nd Samuel. It breaks up the history of David. In the Greek, the title is the, the Bibloi Basilion, or the books, plural, books of the kingdoms, in terms of the later kingdoms of, of Israel and Judah. Uh, it's further called in, in the Septuagint, 1st Samuel is called Bas Basilion Alpha, in other words, the, uh, the first book of the kingdoms. And Second Samuel, as far as far as and First and Second Kings, are called uh, the Second, Third, and Fourth books of the Second, Third, and Fourth Kingdoms. So you get a little bit of a flavor of this in terms of how how the division developed, how the names developed. As far as the author goes, uh, really the author is anonymous. So it has been suggested that Samuel wrote it, but he couldn't uh, have written beyond. Uh, chapter 25, verse 1, which records his death. 
So he may have written that portion, uh, but he did, not, he did not write the whole thing. I look at with me a few verses here real quickly just to kind of see some, some hints we have to put together uh, to discredit certain authorship and consider others. 1 Samuel 10, 25. Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each to his own house. So he wrote a book, but that's recorded in 1025. So it's con considered that perhaps people drew from this book that Samuel wrote to put together what we know to be the accounts of First and Second Samuel. First uh, Samuel 105, After you shall come to Gibeath Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines, and there as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them prophesying. And so there was, they would have been recording the prophecies of, these, uh, of this group of prophets. And then 1920, 1 Samuel 1920, Saul sent messengers to take David. When they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And there's this, this phenomenon taking place where the, the Lord came upon those who were sent by Saul to capture David and bring him back or to take his life there. And they come under what's called the spirit of prophecy. Another example, by the way, in the Old Testament, that the Holy Spirit did not so much indwell people in the Old Testament as he did uh, hover over them and, and use them and then, uh, then release them. Hence, David's prayer in Psalm 51, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Because he had seen in Saul uh, where the Lord took him up by the Spirit and used him and then set him aside and withdrew from him. And David had that concern as well. Uh, so while Samuel was probably not the author of the entire narrative, Sam, Samuel contributed information, no doubt, to it. And it could be that, uh, that one of the prophets under his charge would have done that. Look at, in fact, there's these several books mentioned. Look at First Chronicles 29, 29. Now the acts of King David from first to last are written in the chronicles of Samuel the seer, in the chronicles of Nathan the prophet, in the chronicles of Gad the seer. So you see this, this collection of materials that was available to, uh, to chronicle for us the narrative that we have before us now and also in, in 2 Samuel. So that's just a little bit about the, about the authorship. We, just, we don't really know for sure. Date and setting. If you take that, that Samuel contributed the portion of this, uh, we know that he did so before his death around 1015 B.C. Uh, he was born around 1105 B.C., we know from the, from the records. He ministered as a judge and a prophet in Israel between, between 1067 and 1015. The books of Samuel end in the last days of David. Uh, so they would have had to have been compiled after 971 B.C., the reference in 1 Samuel 27, 6 to the divided monarchy. This, so you take all these things in, into consideration to sort of give a timeline here in which Judah is separate from Israel indicates a compilation date after Solomon's death in 931. But there's silence. There's a reference to the divided monarchy, but there's a silence about the Assyrian captivity which took place in 722 when, when Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians. So the absence of, of that in the narrative uh, probably means that 1 Samuel was written before, uh, before the 722 B.C. event. So the narrative itself tells about the rise of the Philistines. Uh, they oppress Israel uh, really from 1087. Think about this now. From 1087 till 1047 B.C. That for 40 years... Now think about it. What were the uh, Israelites commanded to do when they went into the land of Canaan? To remove the hostile uh, parties. Samson did some of that. You remember the great, uh, where they were taken captive and made a fool of, and he finally brings down the house upon the Philistines. But he did not completely eradicate the threat of the Philistines. And so they're allowed... In the aftermath of the days of the judges, to, lay, to, 
to lay siege of and trouble Israel for about 40 years. One writer I was reading said that the, the, the Philistines lived in the coastal plains uh, and the Jews lived in the hill country, which sort of gave them a little bit of a, of a, of a geographical barrier to keep the Philistines from completely conquering them. As far as the theme uh, and, the, and the purpose, they give us, uh, when, I, when I say they, I'm talking about First and Second Samuel, uh, they, they give a prophetically oriented history of Israel's early monarchy to show what, what the days are going to look like as they move beyond the judges and into the days of the king. Samuel followed Samson, Samson remember, uh, and he had to deal with the Philistines. Uh, there's a transition that comes. The monarchy follows. Remember, the, it goes from judges to kings, from a, from a theocracy. By theocracy, we mean that there were these tribes with different judges over them, and they, were, they recognized that they stood there being ruled by God to a monarchy because the people wanted a king. The monarchy did this. In the tribal days of the judges, they were a divided people. Moving to a king at least moved the people toward a, a, a united kingdom, the 12 tribes united. Then Samuel plays this role of, uh, of judge and prophet and priest when he anoints Saul uh, and David ultimately. Listen to this. This is the clamor of the people for a king. Look at 1 Samuel 8, 7 to 22. This is a little bit of a lengthy passage, but I want you to see, see the, something of the disposition of the people. The Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. This is how, how Jehovah, how Yahweh saw the people clamoring for a king a rejection of him. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt even to this day, forsaking me, serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. He's basically telling Sam, don't take this personally. This is, this is against me. They're simply rejecting you because, because you stand in the closest human representation of me. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and come to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in the day that you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refuse. And listen to this. He's given them all these, these foreboding things that are going to happen. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations. And that was their mistake. We want a king like the other nations have a king. We want a king because the other nations have a king. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard, had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them to the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. 
Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. Now, I want to show you historically how God, it was in God's plan to give them a king. He had intended to give Israel a king. Look at Genesis 49, 10 with me. And then we're going to look at Deuteronomy 17. Genesis 49, 10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. It's a messianic prophecy of the Messiah, but it's spoken in terms of, of the kingship. The scepter not depart from Judah. In other words, Judah will have a king. A line of kings was the prophecy in Genesis. Look at Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. This is being prophesied to them sometime in the distance. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as a king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order that, to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priest. In other words, the idea was that, that the fellow who would come to be king would himself write down the law as a teaching tool to himself so that he would never forget it. And he wouldn't go astray in these ways that the Lord has warned. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. It's very fascinating. When you read that, it sounds very much like God's directive to Joshua, doesn't it? In the opening of the book of Joshua. Do not turn aside, left or right. Keep this law before you. Remember it. And the, and the stated purpose here is that he may fear the Lord, honor him, revere him, and not ever think of himself more highly than his brothers, even though he would sit as king. Well, when you see that, and then you see what Samuel warned them was going to be the result of them having a king like the other nations had a king. It's remarkable in the face of that that they said, no, it doesn't matter what you say. We want a king like the rest of the nations have a king. And, of course, we read to you earlier the results of, of, uh, of Saul's kingship early on in, in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord a greater delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as this man justified, bringing back the spoil, which you can, you can conjecture. I mean, it's, it's, you're reading into the text a little bit, but God's anger makes you wonder about this, that he probably had no real intention of sacrifice. It, this, was, this was typical. This was, taking, this was the booty that you would take when you, when you were a conquering general, a conquering king. You would bring back the spoils and indulge in the spoils. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to listen in the fat of rams, going directly back to what they were told in Deuteronomy, that this should be the heart of the king that God gives you. If you know the story of Saul, you know that he began to be very unstable, mentally unstable. David would be brought in to play his harp, and it seemed to have a soothing effect upon Saul for a season. But, but Saul's... Uh, mental instability, his growing insanity, ultimately was focused on David, particularly in the aftermath of David slaying Goliath. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, Samuel says, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance, that is the appearance of a king, or on the height of his stature. What do we know about Saul when they, when they chose Saul? What was told about him? His, his stature. He was head and shoulders above anyone else in Israel, wasn't he? Yeah. They ignored this. I've always thought it ironic that one of the tallest men, who would have been the hardest not to see, right, 
one of the tallest men, was found hiding in the grain sacks when he got word that he would be their next king. What a, what a contrast and irony there. You knew this was not going to go well from the very beginning. For the Lord does not, sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that's critical to remember when we hear the Lord say about David later on, he, he is a man after my heart. That's the kind of king God intended for them to have. So uh, when, you, when you put all this, try to package this whole idea of the, of the kings that the people wanted versus the king God wanted for them. He gave them Saul because they wanted Saul. He gave them David because David was a man uh, whose heart was after God. Uh, he was a man who manifested obedience and a dependence upon God. And we see that, of course, early on in his life. And it really carries through most of his life, except for that episode where he, where he loses his way uh, when he's looking over the rooftops. At, as the scripture says, at a time of year when, when uh, kings go off to war, David went on the rooftop. We'll talk about that a little more when we get into David's, David's life. Samuel shows us this critical role. It's going to be a growing role of the prophets. Uh, and we see that when we get into the, to the major prophets and minor prophets. The, those who bring uh, this, this burden of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, who speak on behalf of God to the people. It's a more developed role than, than uh, Moses had. Moses comes back and tells them what God has said and writes it down. The prophets are, are speaking forth. They do two things prophetic voice in the Old Testament, it, it foretells what's going to come. You can see it a little bit in the New Testament with Agabus who comes to, to Paul and, and ties himself up with a belt and says, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to be bound away. But in the Old Testament, they, they foretell things, but they also foretell or tell forth. They, they prophesy and declare God's will to the people. The word, the transition is the key word. Uh, the key verses, I've already read one of them, 15, 22. I'll read another one for you, 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. That was, of course, Saul's punishment when he was found to be disobedient. Fifteen chapter is a critical chapter, uh, the transition between Saul to David. Uh, God removes his blessing from the one, gives it to another because sin. You, you should see by now, as we're moving through the Old Testament, this, the, the promise of blessing as the reward for obedience, the promise of, of cursing or judgment uh, as, as, the, as the result of the fruit of, of sin and disobedience. What about Christ? Where do we see Jesus in this? Well, Samuel is a type of Christ because he fulfills these three offices. He is... He is a prophet, a priest, and a judge. Or if you think about the judges, in the days of the judges, these fellows were, were, though they weren't called kings, they were little kings over the tribes. They stood in a position of rulership. We've talked before about the offices of Jesus Christ. The, the Puritans were keen on this and drew this out. The catechisms reflected that Jesus Christ fulfills for us the offices of prophet, priest, and king. And, and Samuel embodies that really in his life, and he becomes for us a type of Christ. And he really ushers in uh, a new era as he was highly revered uh, by the people. There was a series that started on TV, and I honestly have lost the name of it, but it was about this period in Israel's history. And it was, and you had Samuel, and you had, you had Saul, and David was coming along. And it didn't last but just a couple of episodes, but it really looked like it had a lot of promise to flesh out these things, uh, how the people revered uh, Samuel. David is another. Uh, he becomes not only in this book, but throughout the, uh, the Old Testament, uh, he portrays the person of Christ. Think about him. He's born in Bethlehem. He works as a shepherd. He rules as a king of Israel. He's the anointed king. 
He becomes the forerunner of the Messiah. In fact, the Messiah begins to be designated as the son of David. And you'll see this all through the prophets. The son of David. He, he sings, authors these messianic psalms uh, in the book of Psalms. Psalm 22 comes to mind. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry of, of dereliction, the cry of abandonment that Jesus repeats when he's hanging on the cross. God speaks of David as a man after his own heart in chapter 13, 14. We already read that. We'll, we'll see it again here. Christ is the seed of David. He's the root and offspring of David. Let's look at these passages so you can see them for yourself. 1 Samuel 13, 14. I read it a while ago, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Of course, we know that becomes David. He's the one who takes that place. Romans 1, 3. Paul is opening his, his letter to the church at Rome. It's this gospel concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. So he's the, he's the son of David, the messianic designation. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Jesus identifies himself as the son of David. And so David plays this, uh, this messianic figure that we'll, we'll see him popping up as we go through the study. But here it's established in the book of 1 Samuel. What about the contribution of, of Samuel to, uh, to all the scriptures? Well, Samuel is the first book to use the word Messiah or anointed. It's the first time we see it. Uh, in, uh, we, we've talked about that, but we haven't seen the term itself, the anointed one. Uh, it's also the first book to call God the Lord of hosts. We sang it in, uh, in A Mighty Fortress a while ago, Lord Sabaoth his name. Sabaoth is the, is the captain of the armies or the captain of the hosts. It's, uh, we, we encounter these words, Ichabod, uh, which when you break it down, the uh, Ichabod is the glory has departed. And then Ebenezer, it's a stone of testimony. I, I, we, we think of the hymns we sing. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. The Ebenezer was, the, was this rocks of testimony that speaks, would remind you as you saw them, as you traveled, a testimony here of God's presence, of God's goodness, of God's blessing. And then Jesus referenced it. I want to show you his reference to, uh, to this book. Look at 1 Samuel 21, 6. It says, So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from, from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it's taken away. There was this, in the holy place, this bread of the presence. Jesus is being chided by the Pharisees for his, his disciples uh, plucking grain because they were hungry. They do it on the Sabbath. Matthew 12, 3 and 4, Jesus said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. And Jesus takes that episode and teaches from that. It's one of his teachings on what does it mean to keep the Sabbath. And he, he develops from that, that that keeping the Sabbath includes in it these, these acts that seem to be acts against the keeping of the Sabbath. This is an act of, of mercy or necessity, that they were hungry. And that it's not right for one to go hungry on the Sabbath in the name of keeping the Sabbath. So he, he cites this passage in 1 Samuel. Another passage I want you to see is 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but he, but he, but the Lord looks on the heart. Look at Luke 16, 15. Jesus, he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, chiding the religious leaders again, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. He's alluding to this idea that God looks on the heart, not, not on what you 
exalt in the, in the exterior what you show forth. And so you see this, the role of Samuel. It's a great historical narrative, and we're going we're to pick it up. We're actually stopping in the middle of something here. We're going to pick it up with 2 Samuel next week, Lord willing, and see the continuance where it really focuses upon, upon the life of David. It's, his life has begun, but we're going to see it developed out more. It's a, it's a wonderful life. It's a splendid life it's a, with that exception. And when, when he sins against uh, Bathsheba and then sins against Uriah, from that point on, he still makes his way, but it's, it's proper to describe that, that after that, David, who is a man after God's own heart, limps home to glory. He, he, he goes as a broken man because all sorts of misery and difficulty manifests itself in his own household. So that's, that's in, in brief, um, a look at this great historical narrative. The first part of it, the first part of, of the of the books of Samuel. Any uh, questions or comments or observations from that? Anybody at all? Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's a good point, Joe. You see this theme all the way through. It's God looks on the heart. And he, he, he responded to Elkanah and, and Hannah's need. Uh, their hearts were right before him. And he grants them the desires of their hearts. Saul's heart is not right, and that's pointed out too. God's not impressed by outward appearance. More, it really becomes a, it's a great uh, challenge to all of us in it that we not, we not grow stale and go through the motions of worship, go through the motions of Christianity, that we be sure that we're guarding our heart and what we're doing is flowing from the heart. And when we find our heart not right, that we deal with that and, and we pray, pray continually, Lord, pour the oil of your grace over my heart. Because see, if he doesn't pour the oil of his grace over our hearts, our hearts can become a tinderbox of iniquity. But that's a great theme. God is searching hearts. If externals had impressed him, the Pharisees had it made. They looked remarkable on the outside, impressive on the outside. But it's about a heart matter with God. That's great. Anybody else? Yes, Barry. That's right. Yeah. You, it, it seems there in the narrative, particularly what he says to Samuel, obey the people's voice, that God, and, and it's, this is all wrapped up in, his, in the mystery of his providence here, but God had a heart to give them David. He was going to give them a king. Deuteronomy teach, shows us that. But the people were so discontent that God let them have what they were asking for. And they, and they paid they paid for it. And so, so you learn in that there is this, there's the decreed will of God. There's that secret will of God and, and the revealed will. And he lets us time, at times in our lives make choices that will not, it doesn't knock his decreed will out. It, it simply will lead us to his decreed will in another way. And so remember when David becomes king and Saul is, is going mad, people begin to cry out, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. They see in him a champion. And it, I, I agree with you. It's, you. You get the real impression that, that David was God's intended king to give to them. Um, but they wanted a king. The key term is like the rest of the nations had a king. We want, we want a big shot. We want a guy that's impressive. We want, we want to impress the other nations. And that's not God's way. We've been looking at that in 1 Corinthians, haven't we? That's just not God's way. He's pleased to take the foolish things, the things that, that look uh, not noble, and raise them up so that when, when the work comes from them, you're inclined to glorify God. It was easy to, it was easy to praise Saul because God, Saul's a big guy, a lot of stature. You know, look what Saul can do. That wasn't God's plan. And so he gave, he gave them what they asked for. 
But you're right. I, you have to scratch your head about that, don't you? You go, gosh. Wouldn't it have been easier for them if he had just given them David to begin with? But you get the real impression they probably would have rejected David, the shepherd boy. He wasn't a king like the rest of the nations had a king. Good point. Anybody else? Yes, Georgia. What is the purpose? Well, I think the purpose is to show the power of, of the prophetic voice. Okay, that's one of them. I think another a, a sub theme there is that sometimes the, per, the heart of a person gets so hard that you can tell him exactly what's coming, and it's it, there's almost this this brassing over. This is not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen like you said. And if you follow that through, just read that through the prophets. How many times did the prophets go to the leaders? And say, this is coming from, no, it's not. I mean, they'll, they'll throw them in jail if they tell them this. It's not the word. They, so they gather around the prophets that tell them what they want to hear. You're great. You're wise. And many times the, the true prophets uh, ended up in really bad, bad positions. I think it's Jeremiah in it that's thrown in the, in the pit because uh, they don't like what he, what he has to say about what's coming. And so, but, but I think you see in that the, the power of the validity of the prophetic voice. And when God speaks through, and of course the test was, how do you know it's a real prophet? Well, if he speaks and it doesn't come to pass, you stone him to death. He's a false prophet. When God sends a prophet to speak, it happens. And it, but it, to me, personally, it's a lesson. To me, don't, don't let your heart grow dull to what the Word of God is saying to you. Hear it. Embrace it as true. And uh, you, see the, you see the exact opposite with Saul. You see it with the people where... Where when Samuel says to the people, here's what's going to happen. When you get your king like you want, he's going to take your young men. He's going to take your young ladies. He's going to take your land. He's going to take your animals. He's gonna... No. It's interesting, their answer, no. Like, no, it's not. We want our king. And yet everything he said came to pass. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Saul proved, it's almost like Saul read the Deuteronomy passage and said, I'll just put a knot in front of everything. Be the exact opposite. That's right. Anyone else? Yes, Linda. Yeah, Jonathan. Right. Right. It was, it was really it was punishment for the line of Saul. And it was God accomplishing the line of David, which was his plan to, to bring Messiah through. Yeah, Jonathan, I agree with you. Jonathan's a really pitiful figure because he is a true friend. And he goes against his family to, to befriend David, to protect David. And he becomes for us, in my mind, when you, what, what role does he play in the narrative? He becomes for us an example of, of what a, a devoted follower looks like. He went against family at his own risk. He gave up, and, and, and humanly speaking, he gave up the crown to align himself with David and then died tragically, uh, really almost as a result of his father's sins, executed because of that. Yeah, yeah I agree with you, Linda. It's just one of those, well, again, the mystery of providence. We know God does all things well, and we look at that and say, well, gosh, couldn't something good happen to, Saul, to Jonathan here? Couldn't he become part of the court? Or, but you know what does happen? Jonathan has a son named Mephibosheth. And he's welcome to the table of David. When he was a cripple, all things being equal, the king, the new king would come in. The, one of the first things the new king does is he kills all the family of the old king so that there'll be no possibility of a rebellion or of a counteroffensive or of any heir ascending the throne. Uh, and by the way, that happened well into uh, the, the kings, the Tudor kings uh, in England. Same thing. It was, it was a practice they had. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tough pill to swallow. That's where you just come back and say, I know God does all things well. This thing I don't understand. Anybody else? 
All right. Try to read 2 Samuel. Uh, if you have the opportunity, listen through the, through the video before we get here. It's, uh, it's one of those things, there's so much packed in those little summaries that they're, it's good to go over them more than one time and just take it all in. They're great, they're great teaching tools. Let's pray.